have sent me ideas. Here's the, here's the uh, rule, kind of, is that try to make your example have something to do with chemical engineering. Okay? Sometimes somebody comes in and says, hey, I did this cool internship at this company and, and I want to work on this problem, and I'm like, that, that's fine. But unless you have some reason to work on some problem that's not related to, or at least not in the core of chemical engineering, bio is fine, you know, materials is fine. But um, it, So it, what I'm saying is if you send me some example that you find that has nothing to do with chemical engineering, I might suggest that you do something else. You might as well find one that has to do with chemical engineering to start with. All right. So um, we're not going to finish this because we're starting late, um, but that's all right. So I've talked to you in the past, and I promised you for weeks now that I would teach you how to tune a PID controller. <laughs> okay? So this is, the big, this is your big chance. Um, we'll talk about a several different methods to tune PID controllers. And when you guys take the lab in the spring, most of you will take 402 then this is a common problem in the laboratory that you're assigned a problem having to do with PID controller tuning, okay? All right, so um, this is the outline as usual, so I'll introduce the problem here. I'll talk about model base. What I mean by this is we have some model, a transfer function model of the process we want to control and we're going to use that somehow to find these PID tuning parameters. We'll talk more about this in a more systematic way. Uh, starting on Thursday, I guess that is. Um, I'll talk very briefly about online tuning. I'll talk about certain guidelines and troubleshooting. So this is kind of practical stuff here, but still important to know. And then I won't do this today probably, but I will show you a little example uh, when the time comes. Okay, so there's our PID controller in the time domain, right? We call it PID because there's the proportional part and there's the integral part and there's the derivative part. We also have this bias term. And so this is something that um, in order to implement, you need these values. You need the controller gain, the integral time, and the derivative time. Okay? And so for the problems I've given you so far, for the most part, I just picked values somehow. I had magical values. I picked the KC and tau i, for example, and then did a simulation. So now we're going to talk about how we might find these uh, using some type of different methods that I'll describe. So this is the, this is the equivalent representation in the Laplace domain. Okay. Proportional, integral, and derivative. Okay. All right. So what we need here is some way of finding values of the parameters that give what I call good, and this is in the eyes, I'll discuss this a little bit, good performance. Okay. Both for disturbances that we want to reject and set point changes we want to track. Okay. We generally know this. Okay, that we want the controller gain to have the same. So you, we got to keep all these k's and tau's straight. So this means the process gain. Sometimes I'll just call it k, and sometimes I'll call it kp for process. The controller gain I'll always call kc. So we want those two things multiplied together to be positive. So we know we know the sign. If we know the process gain, you know at least know the sign of the controller gain, and you know tau i and tau d should be positive numbers. But that still is a big range to search, right? It's a it's a it's a cube of infinite dimension, so it's kind of large. Um, and so you can do this by trial and error. Okay. I say it's difficult and time consuming. It just matters. Like If you were in the lab um, and you couldn't tune a controller and I came down and the dynamics were fast, meaning it was like uh, the pH system or the time constants of the system are like minutes or less, then I can tune it by trial and error pretty quickly because I've done it a lot. If you Ask me to do this for the distillation column, I wouldn't enjoy that at all because each time you do a test takes like an hour or two to get an answer, <laughs> right? It might take me days to tune the controller. So this is not what we look for. And also, it's not something you can teach, right? I mean, how do you teach that? Just do it by trial and error. Okay, you're done. So I want to come up with systematic ways to do this. And what we're really looking for is um, tune ways to tune that get us good initial values. So in other words, we're not looking to get maybe the perfect value of Kc, but we want to know whether it's like 1 or 10 or 100 or so. Try to get it close to a good value. And then we might fine tune this a little bit. So if you were to, for example, here's your output, and you do a test with your controller. In other words, you've already found these parameters. Now you do a test either on the computer 
against your model or in the real in the real plant, and that's your set point change. And then you your output does this. Okay. Then you might conclude, well, that's a little more oscillatory than I would like. So I'm going to fine tune it by hand. I think. So for that, the first thing I would try is make the k controller gain a little bit smaller and try to reduce the oscillation. So you see, but we're trying to get in the ballpark, a good ballpark, by doing this. May not be the best values, but it'll be much better than we're liable to guess. All right, so this just shows the effect of different controller parameters. So here's, so these are simulations that were done, for example, in Simulink. Here's our process transfer function. It's the same as the disturbance transfer function, and it's just a first order plus time delay. Okay, gain of 1, time delay of 5, time constant of 20. And so someone most likely to generate these results set up a Simulink diagram and just put a PI controller, connected it up in a feedback like we've done before with this process, and simulated disturbance changes. So in other words, the disturbance coming into the system changes at time equals 0. This is all deviation variable, so the, the set point, even though not shown here, is zero. That doesn't change. And because there's a disturbance, it pushes the output away from the set point. And obviously, the idea is to try to get the output to recover quickly. And simulations were done for, what, nine different combinations of the controller gain and the integral time. So it's just a PI controller, no derivative. All right, so you can see that going down here, or let's say going this way, you increase the um, controller gain. And then going this way, you increase the integral time. The thing about the integral time you have to remember is the integral term is weighted by 1 over tau i. So if tau i is small, that the weighting on the integral part is high. Okay? So for example, this means a lot of proportional action because the Kc is large. This means a lot of integral action relative to the other cases because the tau i is small. And you can see this is not good. Yeah. That's just for this example, yeah. Okay, but that just means that the disturbance is a, is a process disturbance? It just means the, pro the disturbance uh, goes, so the manipulated input, so you remember it goes something like this. Um, I'm not drawing the whole diagram, just part of it. So this is what we call GP, and the input goes through that, and then we have another transfer function we call GD, right? And the disturbance goes through that. And we add these two things up, and then that gives us the output y. So all I'm saying in this example is that these two things are the same transfer function. Is it, is it like a practical example? Is that a common, common thing to see? Um, it's common if, if the disturbance occurs at the same point the input. So like it would be for a flow controller or something like that. And but it would be a flow disturbance. Yeah, right, yeah. But this isn't usual. Okay. This isn't the usual case, but it's a toy example to be honest. OK. All right. So up here, controller gain too large, integral time too small. It's un system's unstable, right? So we went through this, um, I think it was last time. Our goal was to find ranges of, these th of KC primarily, the example I gave you. right? We wanted to find range of KC that would make the system stable. You can do the same thing with KC and tau i. Um, for a PI controller, but you would find, okay, this combination is not stable. You can see it oscillates and the oscillations grow. So that's not good. Okay. And you come down to the other extreme, which is way down in this corner here. So this is small gain, so small proportional action and small integral action. In this case, the system is really slow, right? The deviation from the set point, which again is at zero, is, is pretty big and it takes like a long time to get back. Okay? So that's not good. So if you, you know, if you did this case, you'd go, well, that's definitely not good. You can see the, the problem with doing this if you were in a plant, right? So if you're on the computer, you're just like, well, that's not good. I won't do that again. But if you're in a plant, someone's going to walk into your office and say, what, what are you doing? <laughs> you're like, oh, tuning a controller. OK. Um, so that's not good. That's way too aggressive. So when I say aggressive, I mean, the I, for a PI controller, I mean that term too much proportional action and or too much integral action and or too much derivative action. I call that kind of controller aggressive. That's too aggressive, okay. This is too conservative, too slow, okay. So, you know, you can see all these different combinations and the reason this one's in the middle because at least visually it looks the best, okay. Um, we'll talk about in a moment ways to quantify what we mean by good and bad, but I mean this just looks the best, right. 
it, it devi the deviation from the set point is pretty small. It gets back pretty quickly. It has very little oscillations. That's the best combination of the ones tested. All right? But we'd like a method to come, you know, converge to these values, or at least close to these, without just guessing what the values are. Okay, so that's the idea of tuning. All right, so this is what we'd like to do when we have a feedback system, our closed loop system, same thing. Um, this is what we'd like to achieve. Number one, it has to be stable. Otherwise, not much else matters. We'd like to minimize the effect of disturbances, like in the example I just showed you. We'd like to rapidly and smoothly track set point changes. So this would be an example where I would say that's not, it's too oscillatory, OK? Um, you know, you might say, OK, well, that's not so oscillatory. Well, that's not rapid, OK? It's too, maybe too slow. So some of this is in the, a little bit in the eyes of the beholder, but um, you'll see you can quantify these if you'd like. Um, you don't want steady state offset, right? So once the system rests at a steady state or an equilibrium point, you want, you want the output to be equal to the set point. That requires integral action. We know that. Uh, don't use too much control action. So what that means is if you were to have this example, so let's say you're doing a set point change that looks like that. And then I'm also going to put plot the input. Okay. So let's say you manage to tune the controller so it does this. It's like, wow, that's amazing. Right? It's really fast. You might find the input does this. I'm trying to draw this. You see? So let's say this was a control valve. Then to get this rapid response, first thing it does is slam the valve all the way open. Then it slams it all the way shut. And then ultimately it just moved it a little bit, you see? So this would be. Even though this looks good, this is too aggressive. Like this will wear out the valve, and it'll also um, make operations people unhappy because they'll be asking why you're doing this. So you can't just tune these things arbitrarily fast um, and not not see what's happening with the input. Okay. Um, robustness to changes in conditions. That's like if you're running a column and you're tuning a controller on the column, like to control a composition in the overhead or a tray temperature or whatever, it has to be robust to changes in the flow to the column. Like, right? A column, you don't control the flow. The flow usually comes at you. <laughs> it's the flow is whatever it is. So if you tune a control that only works for a small range of flow rate, someone changes the flow rate, the controller breaks. That's not going to be good. Okay? We don't talk about this, but we should talk about it more, but we don't have a lot of time to do so. Uh, robustness to errors in the model. Okay. So let's say this is your model. Okay. So if this was your model and you took this into Simulink and simulated it and got this, you'd say, well, that's awesome. That looks really good. You take it to the plant. If this is a poor representation of the actual plant, then this controller may not work. Right? So if, the, if for example, the time delay is not 4, but it's 8, then this controller, I, I'll tell you, will do very bad. Okay. So if you use a, so it's a heaven and hell kind of thing here. If you, it's nice to use a model to build a controller. But that's only going to work if the model's a good representation of the plant you're describing. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. Okay? We don't talk a lot about that, but implicit in everything we do is the model's pretty good. All right? Not perfect, but good. All right. And most controllers have some inherent robustness, meaning you can tolerate some error in the model. I mean, it'd be disastrous if this number was 4.1 instead of 4 and the thing broke. That'd be You'd never implement a controller. But if it gets to be really bad, the controller won't work well. All right, so this is all the things we want, OK? And some of these things are in opposition to each other. Like, if you want to minimize disturbance effects and you want to track set point changes really quickly, then that'll tend to make large control actions. It'll also tend to make the controller non-robust, <laughs> OK? So you've got to reach some kind of compromise between all these things. All right, so a lot of the methods that we talk about for tuning are based on a model that looks like this. OK, it's just the same kind of model I showed you. First order plus time delay. So we're, um, we're assuming that this type of model is available to us. How do we get this type of model? Well, there's a variety of different ways. We talked basically about two ways. One is you could do a step response. You remember that? You change the input. You observe the output. You fit the data to a model that looks like that. It was a lecture on, I think we called it empirical process modeling or something like that. Okay. So you could find this model from data. If you had a, we also had a few slides, not many, about if you had a high order transfer function, you could approximate it with this type of transfer function. 
there was two members, Taylor series and Skogastad. I said, I know Skogastad. You remember that? Okay. All right. So you could, there's, there's a couple of ways you might be able to find such a transfer function. Okay. But right now, I'm assuming we have it available. All right. And so here's some measures of controller performance. So if we, if we look up here, there's two scenarios depicted here. One is there's a disturbance, right? The set point, all deviation variables as usual, because we're dealing with transfer functions. Um, so set points at zero, you have a disturbance. So it, it moves the set, uh, output away from the set point. Eventually, it comes back. And this hatched area here is some measure of how well the controller is doing, right? If that hatched area is small, then that's good. If the hatched area is zero, it means you, the output never deviated from the set point at all. You can do the same thing with a set point change. So change the set point at time equals zero. Um, oh, they're actually plotting the air. OK, fine. So you see what they're doing here is then, I didn't see this, sorry. They're, they're not plotting the output. They're plotting the air, which is the set point minus the output. Okay. So you, right for a controller, you'd like the air to be 0. So if you have a, a set point change, um, all of a sudden you have a big air, right? Because the set point has changed, and you, it takes time to get there. And the controller's job is to bring it back. And again, this hatched area is some measure of how well you're doing. If the area is large, you're not doing well. All right, but then there's a question of how you measure that area. There's different ways to measure it, and that's what these different air criteria are. Okay, one way, which is the integral of the absolute air, is take the air, take the absolute value. You want to take the absolute value because you don't want like negative air here to cancel positive air there, right? Like you, you don't want, so you could either square it or take the absolute value, whatever. Okay, in this method, you take the absolute value, and then you integrate this from time equals 0 to infinity. So this is nothing but that area. Okay? This here is the integra uh, integral of the squares. This is nothing but the area squared. right? So take, take the air, square it, then integrate it. So what this tends to do is penalize large values of the air, right? because you, know, you square. So th things like this, are, airs that are large are going to be amplified compared to airs that are small. Okay? And the other one is the integral of the time-weighted absolute error. So this just means take the absolute value, multiply it by time, time, and then integrate it. Same as this, except you multiply it by time. So this will penalize errors at large value of time, right? Because it's weighted by time. So the further time goes, the more you're going to care about the error. So you care more about error over here than you do over here. All right, so that's nice. Now, the idea here is that if you have a model like this, and if you pick one of these error criteria, you can come up with ways to tune a PI controller. Okay? And somebody did that. Uh, I won't even bother telling you how they did it. But here's the formulas you have. So this is just, I, th I think the book might have a few more. But this is for one particular um, error measure. This is this in integral of the time absolute error, this one. So somebody took this error measure. They took this transfer function. They said, I have a PI or PID controller. I want to minimize this error. What are, the, what are the parameters that do it? And they came up with these formulas. Okay? This, this is actually pretty old stuff. So, All right, there's some, some details here. But generally speaking, it says, first of all, it asks you, what type of input are you most interested in? So you have to say, well, I'm mostly going to reject disturbances, or I'm going to mainly track set points. What type of controller do you want, PI or PID? Okay? And then it tells you, I'm going to give you an example of this. It tells you how to pick the proportional mode and the integral mode, or proportional <coughs> integral and derivative. And then you notice there's a few caveats here. Uh, a here is explaining what these numbers do. So generally, they mean this. So if you want to know something, so for example, let's say you want to know, you have a disturbance, you want a PI controller, you want to figure out what the controller gain is. Then you use this formula here. Well, I'll show you how to use it in a second. But it says, OK, if it's proportional, y here in this equation is k times kc. So this is k times kc. This is the a and b values that come out of the table. And that theta and tau come from the model. Because right, we're assuming we have theta and tau from a model. You plug the a and b from this table right there. You plug in the theta and tau for your model. You compute some number. That's what k times kc is. You know what kc is from the model. You figure out what k is. Sorry, you know what k is from the model. Figure out kc. Okay. If instead you're trying to figure out the integral part of the controller, the y here in this equation is that. Okay. And if you're trying to figure out the derivative part, the y is that. I'll show you how to use these in a sec. 
Okay, here's the caveat. If you're doing set point changes, then that's not the rec correct equation for the integral mode. It's actually something different. So in other words, you have to use a different formula if you're doing set point changes for the integral mode. So for that thing and that thing, that's why the b's are there. Use a different formula, this formula here. Okay. Um, okay. So let's do an example, and then I'll come back to, to this thing here. Okay. So let's say I give you this um, first order plus time delay model. So there's the process transfer function. There's the gain. There's the, I don't know where I got this thing from, probably from the book. There's the gain. There's the time delay. There's the time constant. Now I would like to figure out what the, uh, tune a PI controller, OK, for disturbance changes. So that means I say, ah, sorry, I have to flip back and forth here a little bit. I say, uh, I'm going to use these formulas here. OK, so there's the A and Bs that I'm going to use. And then to figure out the proportional part, I'm going to use K times KC here. And to figure out the integral part, I'm going to use tau divided by tau i here. Okay. All right. So there it is. I've, I've taken the liberty to divide across by k, but this was basically k times kc equals a, this ratio to the b power. I took the a and b out of the table. You can go back and look. There's the a, there's the b out of that table. For my problem, the theta is that number, the tau is that number. Multiply this out, you get a gain of about 3. Okay. Um, you can do the same thing for the tau i. Now I've taken the liberty of solving this equation. Sorry, I have to flip back. So for this, for this case, there's the equation. Y is this tau divided by tau i equals that. And then I divide it by the tau i. Sorry. <laughs> I solve for the tau i. And if you solve for the tau i, you get this equation here. Okay. Plug all the information in. There's the a and b from the table. You know, for example, a is 0.674, that number right there. Okay. There's the tau from the model. There's the theta from the model, the a and the b. Plug it all in, you get that number there. Okay. All right. So there's two sets of, there's a set of tuning parameters, a PI controller gain and integral time, both about three. If you decide, ah, I want to do the same thing, but instead of doing disturbances, I would like to do set point changes, then you have to use different formulas. For the KC, actually, the formula is the same, but you have different values of A and B. Okay. And so in that case, you'd come over here, sorry. You'd say, ah, set point change, P. There's my value of A and there's B. I don't even bother plugging them in. I'm just telling you what the answer is. Okay. Take the A and B from the appropriate row in the table. You know the parameters of the model, K, theta, tau, plug it in, you get that number. Okay. Um, the equation is different. You might recall, I said if you do set point changes, you want to figure out the integral thing. You have to use a different equation. And this is, so I've used a different equation here and solved that equation for tau i. Just go to the previous slide and see. Get your a and b out of the table, plug this stuff in, get the number. <laughs> OK? It's, I don't know what to say. It's not, it's not interesting. OK? It might be useful, but it's not exciting. All right. So you might see that I have these, t I say, oh, this one's more aggressive and this is less aggressive, or more conservative, I could have said. The reason I conclude this is because I look at the controller gain, I say, this thing ha this has a larger controller gain than this. Okay, That means it's going to put more weighting on the proportional part, proportional part of the air. And then this also has a smaller integral time than this one. Remember, the weighting is 1 over the integral time. So this has a higher weighting on both the proportional term and the integral term. It's going to tend to respond more aggressively. Okay. This will tend to be slower and less aggressive. But you can see that the, the tuning parameters are not radically different, right? This is 3, and this is 2, and this one's like 3, and this is 6. Whoops, sorry. So they're not tremendously different. So you might ask, how sensitive is the performance of the controller to these values? Well, you never know for sure until you simulate it or test it on a plant. But I can tell you, 2 to 3 will make some difference. Okay, but so if somebody said, if you did both these things and you had to choose one of these, you could either choose one and try it or you could just average these values and try 2.5 there or something. But the idea is now you don't have a big range to search. You're pretty sure the good values between around two and two or three. Okay, you're pretty sure a good value of the integral times, you know, between three and six. It's a lot better than you were a few minutes ago. We had no idea. Okay. All right, I, I don't know if we simulate. I guess we don't actually show how these things work in this case. Okay, so now back to the slide before. Now what I'm doing is I'm extracting from this table here. 
and these formulas some general trends that kind of apply no matter what tuning method you use. Okay. So you notice, like for the proportional part, it looks like k times kc equals something. I don't even care what it is. Okay. So that's where I conclude this. The controller gain is inversely proportional to the process gain because you have a formula for k times kc. It means when you solve it for kc, it's proportional to 1 over k. Okay. So this means as the process gain gets larger, the controller gain gets smaller. Okay. So if the process has a large gain, then the controller gain is going to be relatively small. If you have a small process gain, you need a big controller gain. Okay, so this is an important one here. Kc decreases as the ratio of the time delay to the time constant increases. So that's this, that's this for example, you can see here. Okay. So one of the key things in process control, which makes process control unique, is we have time delays. Most other systems don't, most other disciplines don't really worry about time delays. Okay, because they don't have them. So you, the, the process gets difficult to control if the theta is like large compared to the tau. So an example of this is that, let's say you have some, I don't know, reactor, mixing tank, doesn't really matter. I've given you this example before, right? You have a couple of ingredients that go into the reactor, like, you know, A and B or something like that. Okay. So if you want to change the ratio of A to B, you mix them upstream and then right, it goes like a plug until it finally reaches the reactor. And the amount of time it takes to propagate from that point to the reactor would be the time delay theta. Okay. Obviously it depends on the flow rate and the cross-sectional area of the pipe and so on, whatever. Okay. And then there's some inherent time constant of the process tau. It has to do with the kinetics of the reaction, right? the residence time of the, well, the residence time of the reactor. That's a really bad looking tau. All right. So we're interested in this ratio theta over tau. Okay. And as this ratio gets large, this system becomes difficult to control, or any system. Because what it says is most of the dynamics are associated with transport down this pipe, not the reactor itself. So for example, if it takes 10 minutes to propagate down the pipe and then the time constant is one minute, it says you're going to have a very difficult time controlling this process because when you change the amount of B here, for example, it doesn't affect the process for a long time and then as soon as it does, the effect is gone. So you'll always be chasing your tail, if you know what I mean. Okay. Well, you probably shouldn't have a tail, but in any case. All right. So these ratios, if you look at the B power here, the B is always negative and that makes this inversely proportional to this ratio. right? So if theta over tau gets large because this B is minus, the KC is going to get small to compensate. Okay? So that says the only way you can handle this ratio of getting large is to just detune the controller and make KC smaller and smaller to compensate. Otherwise, the system will tend to be unstable. Okay? So I, I hope you can see the, the practical implications of this is that you decide at a current time that I want to change the, the the amount of A and B in the reactor, but you can't change it in the reactor. You can only change it at this point. It takes a while to propagate down. By the time it reaches that, you wish you had a different ratio. Right? And so you're always behind. And if this theta is large compared to tau, it's a, and I would argue this is really a design flaw. It's not a control problem. Right? The solution is move this pipe closer to the, to the reactor entrance, but you won't usually get people to do that. Okay, so that's this one here. Um, then you'll see as the same ratio increases, I won't show you the formula, the integral time um, increases. Okay, you remember the integral time is 1 over tau i waiting, so that means you decrease the amount of integral action in the controller, but the tau d increases. That means you increase the amount of derivative action, because if you go back and look at when I first introduced derivative action, I said the goal of derivative action is to anticipate where the system is going. Okay. So as you increase this ratio of theta to tau, you increase the amount of tau d. Okay. I don't think this is actually implicit in the table anywhere. These things are all extracted directly from the table. This is something independent of the table, because <laughs> okay. you can't conclude this from this. 
But let's say that you wanted to have um, a derivative term in your controller, and you already knew the integral value. So you knew that. So let's say, for example, you're over here. Uh, my integral term is three, right? Let's just say it's three, if you don't mind. All right. I'd like to try derivative action in the controller, but I don't feel like retuning the controller. So one thing you could try is just whatever 3 times 0.25 is, what, 0.75, and see how that works out. It's just a decent initial guess. If you know the integral time, you can make a reasonable guess what the derivative time might be. It's not a great guess. It's better to use the formulas here, but I'm flipping through the slides a lot. I'm getting back to all my bad habits, <laughs> which are myriad. OK. Um, so let's see. So if, if, you, if you go from a proportional controller to a PI controller, I guess it, um, yeah, to a PD controller, Okay, so let's say you have a proportional controller. That means you only have a value of kc. Okay, now you want to add tau i. T generally, you're going to have to reduce the value of kc to incorporate integral action, right? So you have a kc value that comes from just proportional controller. Now you want to add integral action. You're going to generally have to reduce the kc for this to work well once you add the integral action. That's what the first term says. Okay. All right, now you have a kc and a tau i, which means you have a pi controller. And now you want to add kd. You can actually, in principle, increase the controller gain. Okay. You, know, you understand the goal of control, to a large extent, is you want to use the largest controller gain you can, as long as it works. So if you add integral action, that, that limits your ability to pick a large kc. That's bad. But you have to have it, because otherwise you have offset. If you add tau d, in principle, you can make KC larger again. That's good. But that assumes there's no noise, as, as, as we've talked about, and usually there will be. OK. So I've, I've gone through this slide ad nauseum. All right. So that's great. So this, this provides one method. If I give you a first order transfer f function, well, first order plus time delay, you can use these formulas. You can tune a controller. OK, great. Uh, what if you don't have a model? You understand when you're in a plant, usually you don't have a model? Like you're in a plant, someone says, could you tune the temperature controller? An appropriate response is not, can, can you give me a model? Because um, there is no model. So you can get a model if you want. right? You could, in principle, do a step change in the input, measure the output, fit it to a model, and then do what I just said. Um, but let's say you don't want to do that, or you can't do that, or whatever. So you'd like to be able to tune a mo controller without explicitly having a model. Okay. So in principle, you can do it this way. I'll explain this, um, why this might be a bit problematic. But you're going to do something called continuous cycling. Okay. Think of this as more of a conceptual thing at this point. You probably wouldn't want to do this in a plant. Okay. So you connect your controller up to the plant, to the process. You turn it on, and you only have proportional control. I mean, you don't have integral or derivative, just proportional controller. Okay. You keep cranking up the KC until you get sustained oscillations. This won't make you popular with the operations folks, OK? But that's why I want you to think about it as being conceptual. Keep increasing the KC until you get sustained oscillations, OK? So this is an example here, OK? So if the KC, and this KC we call KCU, it's called the ultimate gain. Kind of like ultimate Frisbee, all right? It's the ultimate gain. It means it's the largest gain you can choose and have Sustained oscillations. Anything larger will be uh, oscillations that grow. So this is the case where KC, right? You've picked KC large because it is oscillating, but the oscillations are damped, so that's too small. 